Good afternoon, everybody. You're all awake still after lunch? The graveyard slot, always a good start. Uh, so I'm not Andy, and this is not Ollie. Um, so we're, we're filling in for a couple of our colleagues. So this is some research that we've done um, as a group. NCC do, do two types of research, mainly some is individual, some is group stuff. Uh, this is some of the group stuff we've been working on. Um, I guess really the, the, the key thing for me out of this is to make everybody realize what Internet of Things actually is and how we hack it, which is a bit of a laugh. Um, so the, the good news is it's not as complicated or as scary as, as dark as it, as it kind of sounds, and, or ironically, as, if you're as old and ugly as me, as new and as different as it sounds. Uh, it's basically hardware hacking done the old school way. Um, I'm not going to get on to the stuff that Ken Munro mentioned in his talk recently either, if anyone's seen that. So, but if you haven't, Google it later, it was good. Um, so you've read the synopsis, I hope, otherwise you'd be sat in the other stream, which John has told me that our stream is much better, by the way. So. Um, so we've got about 40 slides in 30 minutes, so we're going to go at this at some pace. Uh, if you've got things you want to shout, shout at the end, it's probably easier. But uh, So we're going to have a quick look through um, modeling, technical, cap technical capabilities, deep dives, how we assess some of this stuff and what we should report on at the end of it. Um, I'll run through the first couple of sections, and then all the techie stuff Brendan can do because he's cleverer than I am. So, uh, What is it? Always a good start. Um, it's a loose term to describe embedded systems, um, computing devices, sensors, generally, getting pictures taken, are scary, um, that use the internet to communicate with each other. It's basically all those things in your home that you these days jack into an ethernet cable without really thinking it through. So um, as I was doing some prep for this and going through, I was looking through my, my lounge and thinking, actually, there is an eight port hub now, or switch, sorry, I am that old, um, behind my telly, and they're all fully occupied. Like, what are they all doing? So. Um, DVD players, Xboxes, TVs, the thing that turns my lights on because I'm too lazy to stand up and walk over and press the light switch. Uh, it drives my wife spare when I kill the lights in the middle of a TV program. Um, the, the, these are all the things we're talking about. They're, they're all basically using IP as a transport. Um, obviously, IP has won the war of protocols over the years. It's pretty universal. Um, and it even, even comes on to things like some wearable technologies, um, some of the Nest appliances that you start to see around homes that are using radio to communicate. Uh, in the background. So we're going to see a lot more of it. I think um, my, one of my friends in the audience, Jeff, is a massive IP6 fan. I guess we're all going to get dragged down that route at some point in the not too distant future. Um, so yeah, pretty pictures. Um, it's a compute device, basically. It's wrapped up in a box. Um, it's, it's a general purpose CPU in most cases, generally ARM architecture. Um, some, some of the systems using microcontrollers. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind is these are just general purpose systems that have been repurposed to a specific task in most cases. Um, they're generally running the sorts of technologies and the sorts of um, languages that we're all used to, C, Python. Um, some of the Windows stuff is .NET. If you've been into in some restaurant recently, where it was using a dot, it was using a Windows application to get drinks out of a drinks dispenser. And it's like, if that's not overkill, I don't know what is, but it's the way that, it's the way the Internet of Things is going. So there's got to be a giggle there to sit there somewhere in the... Uh, a seat nearby and just start squirting Diet Coke all over the next person that walks out. But, um, who would dare do something as malicious as that in a room full of hackers? It's just, couldn't think it through, could you? Um, so these are all components that those of us that have played with hardware for many years are familiar with. Um, those that haven't played with hardware, um, I, I'm from a hardware background, hence I'm stood here. Um, I would encourage you to start playing. So I, I probably had eight years off the soldering iron. Um, and then like, someone dragged me into the wonderful worlds of Pies and Arduinos about five years ago and really got back into it again. It's all good fun. Um, it really is. It's not as difficult and as scary as it looks. And it's all low voltage. So the odds of you killing yourself in the process is pretty low. Um, you might burn your fingers. That's about as bad as it gets. Um, so understanding the purpose, use, and design cases. Um, in order to assess an IoT device, um, we need to look at the systems, the software, how it integrates with other platforms. Um, and by looking at the context that's being used in, looking at the real-world risks that it faces in the attack scenarios, we can get a good idea for um, what the system looks like. So obviously the attack surface for a TV where you've got a, a lot of input devices that are there deliberately for users to play with um, is a bit different for a smoke alarm that's bolted to the ceiling where generally you're not intended to fiddle with it and play with it. Um, for example, we, we've done some work on car systems, as I guess a number of you have heard. Um, Onboard diagnostic ports on cars generally are there to provide that kind of access. Generally, they prefer you not to play with them, but that would spoil all the fun. Um, most of the connectivity stuff that you require for car platforms, for example, you can buy on eBay, because actually people have been doing it for years for good reasons, bad reasons, some 
more nefarious than others. So what we'd be looking at is taking um, common technology platforms and using them to be repurposed into attack platforms. So what are the device components, um, the communications protocols, what do the systems look like? Um, looking at how the, how the, the, the components the pro are, 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 sorry, looking at how the components that are used in these systems talk to each other um, is, is very interesting. Obviously some of them will be by definition a sort of mesh network. Um, you can get involved in the mesh if you've got the right, the right kit on hand. Um, some of them are intended to be far more standalone. A lot of them, as I said before, are connecting out over boring IP protocols. So we, we all know how to um, intercept stuff going out over. That's when hubs are useful, if you are that old. Um, all these funky new mirroring switches that have got clever ports, you can see what's happening. Um, but these are very basic um, systems in most cases. They've been built to do a, a particular job and to do it well. So don't assume there's going to be a massive amount of security that you've got to overcome before you get into these systems. Generally, they're not that complex. Um, I think as, a lot, as a part of a lot of the research going on now, some of them will get better, but some of them inherently don't need to be. And I think if uh, this industry has taught any of us anything over many years, it's generally people will build something as simply and as stupidly and as cheaply as is humanly possible. Um, and security kind of comes along afterwards if you need it. Um, stuff Barnaby Jack did on um, part pacemakers and things kind of proved that it was a bit worrying. So you might have thought there was possibly a health implication there. but. Um, so by understanding these very basic aspects of the devices and systems, we can collect the inputs, look at formulating attacks, and work out what attack scenarios are likely to be valid for the platforms that we're using. Um, equally, in order to gain certain capabilities and interrogate the devices, we need to understand what um, debug ports are available in addition to the, uh, the, the usual um, int intended methods of interacting with these things. Modeling threats, resilience, expectations, um, flow and trust boundaries. So some of these devices have some kind of security concept in them, some of them don't. Um, where there are um, communications between devices is how do we get in there and start interrupting them. So device level, local attacks, communication level, man in the middle and remote network based attacks, system level, integration with the wider system and the platform. So if it's calling home to a, um, a third party vendor for its software updates, that's a really nice and easy way to get hold of the, the firmware to start doing some debugging on it. Um, looking at the threats and trying to work out for each threat what the description of that threat might be, how we're actually going to do the attacking. So if we want to look at smart meters, for example, what do they connect back to? How is that comms, how is that comms working? Um, we're all starting to see these things appearing on our homes in a, a greater level than ever before. So looking at the devices, uh, what are the expectations around a single device or many devices being available? Can we buy them? How easy are they to get hold of? Some vendors make test bits of kit easily available, some make dev kits available that you can interact with more than usual, some are um, less friendly and less willing to give you dev kits, so you have to go out it the hard way. Um, people that work, have done research on sort of um, like hotel comms systems, things in the past, found some of the kit quite hard to get hold of because the vendors think that being obscure about the way they manage stuff is a good plan. Um, what are the system, what expectations the system as a whole is functional? So if you can get hold of a, dice, a device, will it work on its own? Do you need a wider environment to build it into? Um, what's it connecting back to? Can you buy those? Can you use them locally? Generally, we found that building a, a complete test bed locally is the way to go with these things. Then you can kind of have a bit of a gloves off session with it. And if you destroy one, you can generally buy another one. So, um, Not that we've ever destroyed anything in the lab, of course. Um, there's a big pile of stuff that may have gone the wrong way through a, a desoldering kit at one point. Um, and as part of these exercises, we can look to see what the, what the likely outcomes of potential attacks are as well. So are we going to get root on the device? Can we change the config of the device? Can we simply DOS the device? Obviously, for a lot of mesh-type radio systems, that's quite interesting in its own right. Uh, you can take burglar alarm systems offline just by killing the comms protocols. Um, a DOS there is useful, whereas in some other areas, we don't care quite so much. So we look at the, the data and the functionality flows, um, looking at the inputs. Uh, understanding of the device, passive monitoring of, of comms in and out of the device, uh, what's it trying to, trying to do, what's, um, what's behind, I guess, some of the communication protocols that we're using. Are they using standard off-the-shelf protocols, or um, has somebody in their right mind tried to implement their own security protocol, for example? We've seen that quite frequently. Somebody mentioned earlier on this morning, um, I think it was Adrian Nish, uh, and his presentation about um, very simple base 64 encoding being used. Why anybody still uses something as trivial as that when they're trying to hide something, I don't understand, but we do see it quite frequently. 
with the power that's available in off, common off the shelf um, processors these days, you really can't use the argument that a bit flip is a good idea, um, but we still do see it. Um, so we're looking at the modeling with a, a view to trying to distill our understanding of the, the trust boundaries and, and the whole platform really, looking at um, the system data around what, what it's trying to talk to. So in order to assess Internet of Things, we need to look at technical capabilities, um, what's available, software development kits are always a really good start, um, firmware updates, I think we've got some detail on that later on. Um, but we're looking to dump, observe, interrogate, and debug where possible. A lot of these platforms, by definition, need debug capabilities built into them. So there will be JTAG ports lying around, there'll be UARTs hidden away lying around on these things. So um, reasonable amounts of time spent with a, an oscilloscope in one hand and a soldering iron on the other, you can normally find a way into them because somebody has to maintain these pieces of kit. So just because it looks like an ephemeral blob, it probably isn't. Someone somewhere is working with it. So technical capabilities done, what can it do? Is there software? Well, there is software. Um, what's the firmware look like? Is it persistent? Where's it stored? Um, it, it gets a bit more complicated if you've got down to um, pulling off bitstream files from FPGAs, looking at um, how the code in FPGA works can get quite complicated, but it is doable. Um, that, I guess, is one of the areas where working in a team is quite helpful if you can drag your friendly uh, FPGA expert into a meeting and say, there you go, fix that for me. Um, so when we say dump, we mean extract. Uh, we want to be able to dump as much information from the platform as possible, persistent storage, non-persistent storage, so what can we get out at runtime, what we can get out from the, the fixed storage. Our interest in, in persistent storage is twofold. We want to gain access to the software that the device runs and gain access to any configuration data, use data, settings that are on the platform that have been put there, um, either at build time or when the device is in use. So quite often it's useful to if you can get all the device that's been running in the real world, that's generally a bit more interesting than a device that's just been given to you sort of and out of a box from eBay. Um, there's generally more interesting things like, oh, there's an SMP string there. I wonder what that could be used for elsewhere. Um, yeah, we, we bought some interesting kit off eBay, not too distant past, and then started playing these games with it and suddenly realized it was second hand, it had been used, and it was effectively a backdoor into a very large retailer um, because all the, key, all the strings in there were still live, which was interesting. I to report that properly then rather than just sort of continuing our research. They were nonetheless very interested in uh, finding out how it had got there, um, and we had some fairly strong words to say with their um, IT disposal company. So. so we can do all the obvious things, removing the SD card. We can read that in a, any, any standard operating system in most cases, looking at built-in functionality, debugging the firmware, looking for JTAG ports, um, observing data transmitted across memory buses. That's where it's getting a bit more complicated now. But again, you'd be amazed what you can buy off the shelf to do these things for you now. Um, bus analyzers are pretty straightforward bits of kit. They'll give you binary data back off the end of it, you can have a look at and analyze. Uh, chip off analysis, it, you're taking it to the next level and you don't mind destroying a few devices, then you can start desoldering things, reading the comms back off from the hard way. Um, but again, it doesn't tend to work very well. You try and put it back together again in my brutal experience. Maybe my soldering skills are getting a bit ropey. So looking at the buses that are available um, on the devices, um, I2C, SPI, USB, GPO, you'll recognize these. These are all the standard things we've been playing with for years. None of these are particularly new or exciting. Um, these are all standard bits of kit. And because the cost is being driven down through many of these systems, um, we are just seeing standard protocols being reused. It's cheap, it's easy. Uh, a friend of mine um, is a chief designer for Dyson. Um, and he was saying to me recently, they, they now use 32-bit microprocessors to control most of their appliances. And I said, isn't that a slight overkill to run a washing machine? He said, yes, but it's cheaper by like three cents per part than an 8-bit micro. Um, and if you're making 100,000 or something or more, then suddenly your boss is very, very happy when you save three, three cents or something. Um, side channels, um, data power analysis, RF, um, Depends how keen you are, I guess. And, and if you're looking at crypto devices, um, quite often the, the physical security around them is quite good. They've been quite careful about trying to protect some of the I.O. ports. Um, some of these techniques can get you in um, where they'd rather you didn't. And then looking at the system end to end, um, to see what it's trying to achieve. I've jumped ahead on my slides slightly. Um, looking for internal debuggers in the firmware. You'd n never be surprised what you find hidden away on these things. So. Um, Having, having done uh, pulled memory dumps off devices in the past is quite interesting. You send them to somebody who can, who can read hex backwards. I confess that isn't me. If you want to reverse engineer it, that's not me. Um, 
but we've got guys that do, so we send them the data blob and say, read that. They go, oh, look, have you looked at instructions by here and work out what this does? And like, no, try jumping to it so you do. Um, you suddenly get interesting functionality that was just hidden away because it was useful to the guys when they were building stuff, but it was too easy, it was too much hassle, too risky, or they were too lazy to get rid of it um, before putting it into production. Right, I realize I'm racing through, but um, I've yeah, I don't want to take all your time to find this, so I'll hand over to Brendan for the, the deep dive section of this. Uh, so what we're going to do now is just have a little bit of a look at the uh, at the next stage and taking this to the next level. Uh, once you've done your, your fairly in-depth analysis of both the hardware and software components, the broader system capabilities, uh, at this point what we really want to do is, is kind of take this on to, a, to another level with these devices and look at the, the options available to you uh, and really try and understand uh, as much as we can. Uh, and some of it goes back to the, to the very simplistic. It's, uh, it's an amazing amount of information that can be uh, produced through documentation. Um, a lot of uh, modern devices are designed to be played with to a certain degree, uh, and in those cases, then the documentation, SDKs, information you can pull off GPL, uh, for example, these are very useful things for you to be able to pull off information about the inner workings of the system. What you'll also find in a lot of cases is that, as uh, Stuart was saying, the trend towards common oft-used components is something that can't be underestimated. So you'll find in a lot of cases that actually just an examination of the chips that are being used uh, on a lot of modern devices are very common standard components and that actually not necessarily looking at the vendor of the device you're playing with but looking at the vendors of the actual components themselves will give you a remarkable amount of information about what you want to find uh, and how the device can be engineered. Firmware update bundles, uh, if a device does have some form of update, whether that's an auto update system that you can track and watch as it's doing, which uh, is potentially a little more hidden, or whether it's simply a, a ROM that can be downloaded from the manufacturer's website, um, those can give you a really, uh, really good place to look at in terms of pulling off information um, and triggering those updates uh, and unpacking those. And most of them are fairly trivial to unpack if you've got a fairly basic level of skill. Um, once you've managed to actually uh, get firmware, um, it will often be in a big file, um, and in that you may find boot ROMs, uh, you'll find kernel updates, you may find software that sits in the user plane rather than uh, on the ROM plane, um, and then often there'll be some form of security information there, and it's important to not underestimate uh, a lot of people are going to be very lazy when they're compiling these things, so um, the chances of you finding usable security information around the signatures and the checksums uh, given to you when the firmware is being compiled and sent down are actually, uh, are actually quite useful. And what you want to do here uh, is to examine the, the structure of the firmware. Um, there's a lot of tools you can use, so BIMWALK uh, is, a, is a good one for brute forcing um, to a certain degree. Uh, what is definitely worth doing is trying to gather as many different variants uh, of the firmware, so don't just take down the latest version, take down previous versions, look for mistakes, look for changes, look for commonalities uh, that can help you understand the structure of the firmware update that you've been given. Um, and on top of that, look for things that are in clear text, look for things that may have been potentially encoded. Um, as we say, a lot of people, again, still lazy with these things. They don't expect you to be looking at them. They don't expect people to be looking for vulnerabilities. So a lot of things will be either left in clear text or encoded in very simple manners or otherwise obfuscated in, in simple processes that you're going to be able to reverse uh, fairly easily. When we start looking at uh, some of the more secure devices, then people are now routinely um, encrypting uh, and using dig digital signatures on a lot of newer firms. Um, for devices that have higher security implications. And at that point, you're simply increasing the amount of time that it takes. Uh, so uh, you're looking at actually trying to examine this on device rather than uh, in packages that are downloaded. When we're looking uh, at a lot of devices, you'll find a, a separation, uh, as we find from everything from iPads through to slightly low-level devices, uh, some form of bootloader and some form of operating system or system software that sits on top of that uh, in order to run the, the kind of user-level functionality. Um, so try and examine both. Look at where the bootloader um, calls the operating system. Look, is that something that comes down in the firmware? Is that something that's hard-coded onto the device? Look at where um, the boot ROM is being stored. In some cases, it will be stored on a separate boot ROM chip, and those are things that if you've got hardware skills, you can look at starting to interrupt and interpret how the bootloader is calling the operating system. Uh, in some cases, we're seeing now on the more modern uh, devices that actually the boot ROM is built onto the main processor, uh, and so that starts to make things a little bit more difficult. But if you can understand not only uh, the structure of the OS, but how it's being called, how it's being implemented uh, on the device, then you start looking at ways to interrupt uh, and start booting your own uh, OSs uh, from the bootloaders themselves. 
what you need to do, and what's very important, as I was uh, mentioning in terms of, of components, is to look to identify the technologies being used. And this applies as much to the software level uh, and the OS level as it does to uh, the hardware level. We're in an age now where almost nothing seems to be written new. Wherever it is uh, that's being used, there are going to be common libraries, there are going to be common components. Uh, it's a lot cheaper, particularly on these small scale devices where your manufacturing cost is being kept as low as possible. That as well as hardware components being off the shelf and being reused, you're often going to find that software components are also uh, being pulled off the shelf, being reused. In a lot of cases, devices, even those that have got some form of sensitivity around the data they're storing, will often use open source libraries uh, in terms of what they're uh, storing on the device open source encryption, uh, open source uh, components. So look at the, when you're examining the, the boot, if the boot ROM and the OS, if you're able to dive into those, look at the open source components. Are they up to date? Are they being maintained? Is there any form of updating to ensure uh, that at all times that those are using latest components? You may well find that actually even a relatively new ROM is using an older version of a common third party component or open source component that you may have known vulnerabilities in them. And again, the same with security algorithms you may find actually that even relatively new uh, pieces of code in the operating systems are using old algorithms that are now known to be insecure. Um, and we, we're seeing that quite a lot on, uh, on some of the newer devices, particularly around their implementations of HTTPS uh, that they're using for, for communicating back to a broader part of the network. So once we've gathered as much information as we can in terms of identifying the device, its components, what's available on it, what they're using and how they're doing it, uh, it's time to start looking at... Uh, Skipped a little bit too much on. Uh, time to start looking at how we actually assess the device uh, from a vulnerability standpoint. Uh, fuzzing tools, obviously, um, are going to be uh, one of your keys on these. And depending on your experience uh, and what level it is uh, that you're going to be testing at, whether you're going to be looking at testing it purely from an operating system point of view, um, whether you're going to be going a little bit deeper into the hardware, whether you're going to start sending unusual commands directly to chips on board, or whether you're going to be using JTAG for debugging and viewing what the signals that you're sending are doing. Um, fuzzing is, is, for most of these devices, a very valuable way to find out what they're doing. And obviously, that depends on the type of, uh, of configuration that you're looking at. Uh, a, a higher level device which has an onboard OS that's a known one, so a, a Windows embedded, for example, something running uh, a well-known or a, an interpreted language, you're going to have a lot more success uh, in terms of doing things at a higher level, whereas devices that are running uh, purely based on assembler, for example, are going to be a little bit harder for you to find that. Uh, so it's important that uh, you look at the tools that you have in your archive. Um, so uh, unusual protocol fuzzers are things that particularly at NCC Group, something that we've been working on for a couple of years now, and our team have been able to develop protocol fuzzers for things like USB, um, Bluetooth, infrared, uh, a whole raft of, of slightly unusual um, fuzzers that we can use to start communicating with devices that don't have the standard inputs that we would uh, expect to see on traditional um, hardware computing models. So it really is about understanding the product, um, using it, finding out when it starts to do things that are a little bit different, and looking for the indications uh, that might show you that it's doing something unexpected when you're fuzzing it. Uh, and obviously, you have to be very open-minded uh, when you're doing this to look at the ways that we're responding, because it won't be responding differently uh, in, in the same manner that other systems might do so when you send it something it doesn't expect. Um, and I am aware that we're running short on time, so I'm going to very quickly run through an example. Um, so the example we're going to show you here, uh, it is a public domain one. It's one that uh, NCC Group have talked about a lot. Um, so we, uh, one we've actually helped uh, the vendor in this case uh, talk about. So um, what we're going to talk about is less the vulnerabilities that we identified themselves, but about the methodology uh, that our researchers used in terms of, dis of discovering uh, the particular vulnerabilities in the products uh, and how we helped the vendor uh, to mitigate that uh, around their own processes and their own uh, life cycles. Uh, so many of you may have been aware, if you, uh, if you follow the research in this field, uh, NCC have been uh, at the forefront of uh, automotive computing uh, and automotive hacking in terms of our, our research team. They've been doing an awful lot of work, both with vendors and independently. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we've noted in uh, several, uh, several vendors, uh, but primarily the one that we were engaged to work with uh, in the middle of last year, uh, a lot of vendors uh, have aftermarket um, onboard diagnostic ports that are still available. Um, 
the automotive industry in terms of uh, the way it operates computing hasn't really moved on uh, in about 30 years or so, really. Uh, so are those certain things on uh, certain things at a high level have improved? They started to use encryption. They've started to use more intelligent software. Uh, the very basics in terms of the hardware connectors that they use, uh, in terms of the protocol that they use in for their diagnostics for relative uh, components of the car talking to each other uh, are actually uh, still very much as they were. And so that's allowed pro a proliferation uh, of tools, techniques, languages uh, that can be used to interpret those being available on eBay, being very openly uh, known about and talked about. Uh, so in this case, the product, the product we were looking at, um, the onboard diagnostics port allowed you to interact with the car, for example, for unlocking the doors um, or opening the rear trunk hatch. Um, that was a very trivial thing to do. Um, the onboard diagnostics also allowed access to the car's onboard GPS so that you could find the location of the car. Again, the onboard GPS itself was secured in a fairly sophisticated manner uh, in terms of tampering with the GPS. However, uh, because it was linked back to the car's tracking system, which was operating at a much lower level, it was very easy to uh, request the GPS location from the car itself. Uh, and here you can see that uh, on the uh, device there, you've got uh, uh, an exposed uh, UART port that was very easy uh, to access. Uh, and it was very, very quick and easy uh, with 80 commands to, to set firmware access. Um, it was a very old, very well-known, very documented protocol. Uh, and it was very easy for us both to gain access to the firmware. Um, and then once we had access to the firmware, to review it, to break it down, look at the building blocks, uh, and then uh, reflash that uh, with a version that gave us far greater control over other components of the car that we wouldn't necessarily have had previously. Um, why was it so easy? Uh, well, again, we go back to old school protocols. Uh, relied on GPRS encryption um, for communications. Uh, everything was done clear text HTTP. There was very little uh, encryption on any of the actual uh, transport mechanisms sat on top of the basic transport. Um, we created a real world uh, rogue Bluetooth. Um, and the car itself had uh, near car unlocking, which made it very easy uh, for us to create a countered key fob, uh, which we could use to unlock the car. Uh, and the, uh, in terms of the people developing the software on here, all they'd done was built very new functionality on top of very old uh, firmware, very old uh, methods uh, that enabled us to break into that uh, with uh, relative simplicity. Uh, we went back to the vendor after we'd completed this work, uh, and this is something we're pushing forward uh, in broader terms for the industry. Um, Looking at uh, each device having its own cert uh, certificate authority um, so that uh, code can be signed uh, in terms of uh, making sure that firmware that's loaded onto the uh, car can only be uh, that which is already signed and known about. Um, using TLS, uh, so getting away from plain HTTP the way the rest of the world did about 10 years ago, ideally, um, and uh, managing signature checking uh, on firmware that's being downloaded and flashed onto the device. Uh, in a broader um, sense, uh, locking down APIs, it was very easy to gain access to the APIs on the device. There was almost no security uh, required once you had physical access to the, to the, uh, the device. There was almost no lockdown on the API. Um, and within the application itself, uh, it, the firmware was very old and been built on and built on and built on. Uh, and vulnerabilities had crept in over many years uh, that had never been looked at uh, on the assumption that nobody was ever actually going to be trying this uh, until we came along. A bit of a whistle stop of that example. I'm uh, more than happy to uh, talk about that in uh, further detail. Um, very quickly go over our conclusions because I'm about to get kicked off the stage. Um, IoT, it's one of these wonderful buzzwords. It's one of these things the media are going to love talking about, and we love new terms, we love new buzzwords. All it is is talking about taking uh, embedded systems, things, non standard computing models, uh, connecting them to the internet and reviewing the threats posed by those. Uh, in order, the same as with any, any device, in order to understand, uh, in order to uh, approach it and assess it, you have to understand it. Um, and that means that some of us who uh, are far more familiar with the desktops, networks, uh, the more uh, commonplace. Uh, easier to review computing systems.